this is wealth that they're holding as part of assets. And we think taxing that, which is static wealth that's not really helping, is really, really sensible. The, the bigger two parties will want to not discuss because their agenda is very, very similar and very, very narrow. If people want to have uh, politicians there raising issues from the left, from the side of the environment, from the side of people who want to see more redistribution of wealth, we're going to be absolutely essential in making sure they keep having to answer to people who want this. One of the last things Caroline asked about in Parliament was stopping UK arms sales to Israel. All these questions do need to be put to the new government as well. It's, it's unclear to what extent Labour will prioritise that. I'm hoping there will be a change, particularly on arms sales, but it doesn't seem like Kirsten is currently committed to that. I'm Sean Berry, I'm the Green Candidate for Brighton Pavilion. You've got a very attractive wealth tax, mm. a wealth tax that really appeals to younger voters. Can you talk to me a little bit about that? It is an, a massive missed opportunity in all the other people's manifestos. A wealth tax on people who just have more than £10 million, that's not almost anybody, and just on the wealth that they have above £10 million, it raises enough money to really help the NHS, it raises billions and billions of pounds and it doesn't affect most people at all. If you ask people about different tax measures, this comes out as one of the most popular ideas and it's just fair, it's asking the broadest shoulders to bear the burden of helping rebuild one of our most important institutions. People really want this, it's completely sensible idea, it's completely normal in other countries and the other parties are not considering it. I'm really proud the Green Party have started talking about this in the election. It means that it's part of the debate, it means that interviewers like you are asking um, the other parties why they're not doing it and I think after the election that's still a debate we can have with the new Labour government. That's why Green MPs are going to be important because we will keep ideas like that which are completely sensible and do a lot of good alive in Parliament. So the counter argument to it is that you might have a situation like in 2016 in France where something like 12,000 millionaires fled the country. But I mean, how important is it really to keep those, well, billionaires in the UK? How, how effective do you think trickle-down economics is? <laughs> it's a very good question. I mean, are they creating wealth? or has wealth concentrated and is just being held in their hands. And the wealth that we would want to tax isn't wealth that they're reinvesting in businesses or you know, giving out in job, um, in job salaries. This is wealth that they're holding as part of assets. And we think taxing that, which is static wealth that's not really helping, is really, really sensible. There's a completely different set of policies for, for businesses and helping to ensure that, that small businesses that are growing get more help. All of that's completely separate from personal wealth that has concentrated to that extent. And in the France example, you're right, we think they set that too low. It created administrative problems. It starts to trickle down to the effect that it trickle down, what we're saying, um, it starts to um, come down the wealth ladder to the extent where it's starting to affect people's primary homes. That, that starts to become um, a little tricky and where you've got people who might suffer from it unfairly. But £10 million is a really, really good um, threshold and everyone seems to think that's a good idea. And how much cut through has that threshold had when you're out canvassing? So people who, I mean, we, we're in Brighton and there are million pound homes around here that there are. Um, do those people recognise that that's not a policy that's going to affect them? I, I, to be honest, I, yeah, I do. I knock on the, the £1 million plus houses and not many people have said to me, does, does your tax affect us? So I think the, the, the £10 million threshold is, has been noticed by people. Um, and when people say, um, you know, are your tax plans realistic? Um, or do you, do you, will you scare lots of people away? Which is the questions you've been asking me. Um, it, it is only very, very few people. And those few people do have, they have other ties to the UK other than that it's where they keep their wealth. It's where their families are, it's where their businesses are. Um, they probably love the country as much as we do. There's a whole group called Patriotic Millionaires who are literally asking for this. Um, so yeah, we, we, we think it's not really coming up on the doorstep as an issue, um, even amongst people who are wealthy. When you... I'm not sure I've met anyone who actually has 10 million pounds yet though. No? No. <laughs> Maybe they're hiding it. Um, Earlier you were talking about uh, essentially being a pressure group. If you get into Parliament, if you win this seat, mm. you're going to be able to raise these sort of topics, like a wealth tax. Mm. 
more green infrastructure. Is that how you see your role going into Parliament as a pressure group? We've also been described as the conscience of the Parliament and I think that's a really good way of putting it. Um, we're the people who will make sure questions are asked, to make sure debates are held, make sure you know, occasionally that there's a vote on issues that matter to people that perhaps the, the, the bigger two parties will want to not discuss because their agenda is very, very similar and very, very narrow. If people want to have uh, politicians there raising issues from the left, from the side of the environment, from the side of people who want to see more redistribution of wealth, we're going to be absolutely essential in making sure they keep having to answer to people who want this and have to give enough details so that we can scrutinise whether they're policies are actually working or having bad effects on, on different groups of people who often get ignored. So we'll be there as a voice for disabled people. We'll always listen and always raise when a policy is coming forwards that will have really disastrous impacts on very small numbers of people, but ones which we're listening to. You've had your manifesto, it has quite a bit of crossover with the Liberal Democrats manifesto. Have you mm. had any conversation with them about perhaps teaming up? Well, there are issues where we're, we're quite close in policy and there are other issues where their policy is in the same direction as ours, but is much, much smaller. Um, so things like on the water companies, they are not talking about bringing them back into public hands. Their investment in green um, infrastructure in a Green New Deal is much, much smaller. The money they're putting towards social care is much less in the NHS. Um, but, but we do agree on some issues where we're both on the a different side to Labour and so there will be stuff where we'll be teaming up with other parties in Parliament to, to raise issues, to put motions, to, to put things onto committee agendas. It's but really important Labour. that we do work cross party mm. in, in opposition. Well, with, but because with Labour there, there is actually potential to work with quite a lot of the, the, the further left, mm. you know, particularly on things like nationalisation, there's a huge impetus for nationalisation with a lot of those MPs. Have you had yeah. conversations with them about that? Well one thing we have had uh, talks cross-party about already and Caroline's already worked on is a Green New Deal and the investment that's needed there. Also the Climate and Nature Bill. These are two bills that we've got completely ready to put to Parliament and to do that we will want to be teaming up with uh, Labour backbenchers, with Lib Dems, with anyone we can find who is able to put a private member's bill, which I, do, there's a lottery when you enter Parliament and it's, um, it's, it's very much chance whether or not you come top. But there's a good chance that one of us who wants to put this bill will be high enough up to put these bills through. So yeah, these are, these are things we're already thinking about. Yeah. You'd also be representing a constituency that already has green infrastructure in it. Would you say that the, the wind turbines that you have just offshore, I mean, how, how do they work within the community? I, I remember them, um, obviously they're owned by, they're owned by a, a, a private company and so the, the, the community is not owning that wind farm and that's much more what we'd want to see as Greens. But I remember when they were put forwards and there was a lot of controversy about being able to see wind, wind turbines from, from the beach and, and, and lots of worry. But they're a really hopeful site, you know, residents do point to it when I'm talking to them on the doorstep because it's quite very, very visible. Um, as something they're quite, they're quite proud to have in the local area. And, and we, we do need more offshore wind, we need more onshore wind, we need more um, solar panels everywhere that we can do it. We could massively increase the amount of renewable energy that there is in this country on about 3% of our land and a really small amount of our um, actual coastline and it would make an enormous difference. We've got to move towards that, that target of getting rid of all fossil fuels from our electricity infrastructure as quickly as we can. And that's something again where Labour are making plans, we needed to push them to do, do it faster and be bolder. Do you think you'll be pushing them as well on their stance on the Israel-Gaza conflict? This the conflict is still not over. We've been calling for a ceasefire for so long and for, for peace talks to, to start. One of the last things Caroline asked about in Parliament was stopping UK arms sales to Israel. All these questions do need to be put to the new government as well. It's, it's unclear to what extent Labour will prioritise that. I'm hoping there will be a change, particularly on arms sales, but it doesn't seem like Keir Starmer's currently committed to that. This is going to be one of the first things we pick up. And again, it's one of those issues where there needs to be a green voice so that those questions are asked promptly and answers are got.
Is it something that comes up on the doorstep often? It is one of the issues that's coming up more and more on the doorstep. Um, the top issues, and we've been doing surveys and knocking on doors and, and noting all of this, really, really listening to people in Brighton. Um, the top issues are undoubtedly the NHS, education issues, the sewage that's not only on our beach, in the sea, but also spilling out onto pavements right across the city. We've got a serious issue with that. Um, but also, yeah, Gaza's coming up uh, an awful lot, as well as the climate investment that we really need, particularly young people are raising that. Well, young people, I see what I find fascinating about the Green Party is it seems to be, well, you and Reform seem to be the only parties that are actually directly going after young people. Oh, that's interesting. Do okay. You, yeah. Have you not found that at all? Have you catered particularly towards the under 35s? Well, we'll always listen to young people. We've got a really strong and, and large proportion of our party is people under 30. They're very organised. I was co leader for three years and, and had a really good relationship with the young Greens. Listening to the young people within the party is very, very important. I'm also being supported by Green New Deal Rising, who are a, an organisation of young people pushing for the Green New Deal. Um, that's why I've made such a strong commitment to, to put forward that bill again and work with the other champions that they're trying to get elected around the country. So I would always naturally reach out to young people, always listen to them. One of the biggest achievements that I made while I was a London Assembly member was getting the Mayor of London to fund youth services and that came directly from listening to young people before I was elected, making a pledge to them to look at the cuts that there had been to youth services and push the Mayor until he funded them and I did, it took a, took a while, it took, it took a year and a half and he did put money back in and now he's very proud of that, his, his own achievement but does credit um, the work that we did to, to push him to do it. Do you think that um Perhaps the election date being put on July the 4th, you have got two universities in this constituency. We do, two great universities, do lots of support from the students. Those students mm. would likely vote for the Green Party. And I'm not saying that perhaps Sunak has deliberately done this to mess up the, the, the Brighton uh, voting age. But do you think perhaps up and down the country, is there is there any thought in your mind that perhaps he might have done it deliberately? I'm, I'm not sure, I mean, I'm not sure he's that worried about the, the green vote in this particular area, but I think in some areas there is a concentration of students and potentially the Conservatives might have thought about that. But I'll be honest, I think the timing of the election, apart from in order to win money on gambling, um, was set because he just couldn't do it any longer. This government is finished, the Conservatives are toast. They want to end it, we want to end it, and we do need a new government. But we need a new government that's pushed by Greens to think bigger and do better. And that's what we're promising. Rishi Sunak, of course, wants to, to mm. deport asylum seekers yes. uh, to a safe third country. That's the language that he uses. Mm. Um, he hasn't been able to do that yet. Yes. Do you think perhaps he pushed it forward? You think he wouldn't, he wouldn't have been able to if he delayed until the autumn still, and that would have looked even worse than the fact he hasn't done it well, until I now. You, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Um, I'm not sure that was his biggest consideration. I think he's tired and he's fed up and he wants to stop. Is it on your mind, so the Rwanda man? Yes, we've got um, a commitment from Labour to abandon that. That needs to be done immediately. Um, they, if they put that off, um, if they leave people in limbo, waiting to be deported, that will be a really, really poor show from them. So we want that to happen within the first day.